طبعا قبل ما نبتدي ان شاء الله بحب اشكر اللجنه المنظمه وعلى راسهم الاستاذنا الاستاذ دكتور طارق صفوت الاستاذ دكتور عادل الخطاب وكل اللجنه المنظمه على المجهود اللي هم عملوه وعلى الدعوه الكريمه لحضورنا ونبتدي ان شاء الله السيشن بتاعنا على القاف واول سبيكر بروفيسور اسامه عبد الحميد توك اباوت اي ان تي بريسبكت صباح الخير كل سنه طيبين. First of all, I, I owe some uh, thanks to my colleague and uh, dear friend Dr. Adel Khattab for inviting me الحقيقه للميتنج ده. أشكر الدكتور طارق صفوت طبعا أستاذنا أجين uh, إنما الحقيقه الشكر should be directed to Dr. Adel إن هو he benefited me الحقيقه يعني uh, إحنا كل ما بنكبر وإن ذا إن ذا يعني في دوشه الشغل والعمل احنا كاين تي دكتورز ميبي كونسنتريتنج مور على السيرجيكال اسبيكتس اند سون الحقيقه ات واز ا جود تشانس ان انا اي جو باك اند ريد اباوت كوف وكان كل ما عادل يبعت لي العيان يقول لي ده عنده بوست نيزل ديسشارج كنت يعني بقول يعني يعني مش معقول يعني شويه البلغم دول هم اللي عاملين الكحه المستمره دي سو وين وين اريد اكشولي ان ديبث ان ذس Subject I found uh, very important things, and we're gonna um, high point on these things while I'm presenting. And um, here everyone coughs. So, and cough, of course, you know that cough is a protective mechanism to protect the lower respiratory tract. It is the most common symptom in the GP uh, setting. Well, around 40% of many referrals of the GPs is related to the current cough, which is about 12% in the population. And antitussive uh, prescriptions in the United States, where they are very fond of the uh, statistics, uh, accounts for uh, four billions per year, which is a big money industry. And cough also is a common symptom in the ENT practice. Uh, as of course you know, cough is divided into acute type, which is less than three weeks, subacute between three and eight weeks, and chronic cough more than eight weeks. When it comes to the acute cough, of course, in the, uh, in the, in the process of the acute upper tract infections, the common cold and, and so on, bacterial sinusitis, allergies, um, foreign body inhalation, uh, these things usually present with cough. And sometimes cough is the only presentation of pneumonia or congestive heart failure. And so we need to be very aware, uh, uh, very careful while managing cough in the, uh, in the old uh, generations. I think in the subacute cough, Usually it's a persistence of the acute symptoms, but for us in the ENT practice, I believe that the foreign body, especially in children, when you have a, a child who is otherwise free and have intermittent attacks of cough, we need to think about foreign body inhalation. And most of the times, I think we um, succeed to find a foreign body in one of the main bronchi. Now we come to the issue, which is a chronic cough. Uh, before I go into depths, I need to identify that is really chronic cough is a severe problem. I didn't realize this. When you see, when you see things related to chronic cough, you're going to be frightened. So psychologically, um, a lot of effect on the quality of life, lifestyle, social isolation, sleep disturbances. When it comes to neurological, from CSF leakage up to uh, uh, the embolism, uh, headache, uh, seizures. Uh, and the skin, you have petechia and peripheral crashes, and then when it comes to musculoskeletal, you may have rib fractures, you have diaphragmatic rupture, you have a sternal wound, a patient having a, a, a sternal wound in cardiac surgery, you may have dehiscence, and then we may have in the respiratory tract, your domain, you may have uh, pneumomediastinum, pneumoperitoneum, ophthalmology also, you have a spontaneous compressive orbital emphysema, you may have bleedings anywhere, uh, and then uh, GIT disturbances as well, and the urinary incontinence as much. So, uh, chronic cough, before we go into depth, really it's a, a bothersome problem. And, uh, and actually also, this is very new to me. Yeah, there are studies showing that per hour, you may have like 150 coughs per hour. So, um, I'm sure that you know that. This is new for me. So, if, if, uh, if in, on, on the average, you're talking about around 50 coughs per hour, which means less, uh, m almost every minute patient coughs. So, this is very disturbing, and that's why when you see to the social impact of the chronic cough, you see these studies showing you how much psychological impact on the patient who are having this chronic cough, ranging from he feeling that there is something serious, 
uh, or something wrong, uh, exhaustion, embarrassment, self-consciousness, difficult speaking on the phone. So the numbers are really very impressive about this problem, which is chronic cough. And then when you go to the ERS and ELF, you see the impact of the cough on the uh, activities. And you can see here that um, um, when you have cough, it stops doing things like sometimes 50% and frequently 28%. Uh, cough feels, uh, feeds up depressed because of the cough. Again, 55% and I add 35, talking about almost 90% of patients. Um, does cough disturb your worry or partner or family or friends? Again, very impressive. Does cough affect your quality of life? Again, very So we have um, a, a, a symptom. Let us start saying it's a symptom uh, or a syndrome um, uh, having a bad effect on the quality of life. More uh, a study showing that either total uh, physical or psychological effects of the cough has a very impa important impact on the quality of life. And then when you treat and patient improves, then you can see that the quality of life starts to be better after uh, scores are getting better in all the domains, either in the, um, uh, the total or visual, uh, visual social or the physical. It gets better when you treat the patients and this is very, really very important to show how much. So the second issue would be what are the causes? The list is very long, but it, it's, it's sim getting simpler because Post-nasal discharge, the one I debated with my friend Adil, it comes on the top of the list. And uh, then the reflux, then the cough variant asthma, I think this is your area of domain. The EC inhabitants, you know about all that, and chronic bronchitis. These actually form like 95% of the causes of chronic cough. And then the rest of them can shoot the 5%, but remember, it's always, almost always, 75% of the times it's multifactorial. There are more than one cause. Hena uh, Bikharina Ashok, is it cause related or well, is it a sort of association? Two common problems, you know, such as reflux. Reflux is a common problem and cough is a common problem. Is it cause and the effect relationship or its association being two common things? Actually, this is not very clear. Uh, but there's another study showing that uh, 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 like almost like 60% of the time there are more than one cause affecting the chronic cough or causing the chronic cough. And another study, uh, actually a very a, a nice multi-meta-analysis um, uh, uh, <coughs> study uh, showing that most of the times of these studies, either the asthma or the postnatal discharge or the reflux, these are Commonly, the, mo the, the m m one most important single factor causing chronic cough in those patients, and again, this is 13 studies in the meta-analysis showing that the asthma syndrome is about 25%, the esophageal disease is about 20%, and the rhinitis and post-nasal discharge is about 34%. So then you have to respect these studies. Meta-analysis studies, as you know, is a level one um, uh, evidence-based medicine nowadays, and when you, when you go to the meta-analysis and see these things, you have to be believe them, and you should believe them. So in, in, in our area of domain, about 40% of the patients are causing by the post-nasal discharge. This is really very impressive to me, at least. And then when you add the reflux and the asthma variant, so it counts, as I said, up to 80%. And then comes a sector, which is unexplained cough. Exhausting yourself, investigating all the possibilities and the etiologies of the chronic cough patients you are having, then you may find idiopathic up to 12%, 22%, 18%, and there are some recent studies accounting for up to 40% of patients presenting with chronic cough, you don't find the cause. And then, then they start causing it by some moha, mara idiopathic, mara refractory, mara persistent, mara psychogenic, mara tick cough, and then comes a very important title, which is the sensory neuropathic cough. I here have to acknowledge my professor, Dr. Magdi Hamid, who is 30 years back, very, very old time, 30 years back, he, he taught me something very important. When you have a patient with chronic cough, give them, give them Tegretol. Tegretol as an anti-neurotic uh, uh, drug uh, used to improve those patients. And then in 2006, I have to go, um, uh, uh, okay, I'll show you another slide later on. But in 2006, in the very famous journal, The Lancet, they talked about the neuropathic uh, cough, uh, treated with uh, drugs such as, um, it looks to, uh, similar to the Tegretol, but new, new, newer ones. So in the ENT practice, another famous study in 2012, Again, it comes the post-nasal drip is an important factor. And then we have 
an influx, a range of dysfunctions, trachea, 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 language, trachea, stenosis, which is, again, in children, you have to think about it, systemic disease, neurological causes on, on the larynx, drugs, obstructive sleep apnea, and large tonsils. Um, when you see these things, these are the larynx, and these are polyps in the larynx, of course. It is, uh, it's very conceivable to cause cough, but when you have those large tonsils, uh, I mean, we are not sure that these large, but these, again, an association. It is not a cause, definite cause, but um, you advise the patient to remove the tonsils. Uh, I really don't have an answer for this. When it comes lower respiratory tract, in our area in the ENT, we usually think about the foreign bodies, but I'm sure that you think about these things. And then at the end, they left some group, which is idiopathic or psychogenic. Uh, workup starts with the history, and we're not going to go into these details, but what's really what matters to me, when you look at the investigations, it's very long investigations, it's costly, uh, money expensive, time expensive, so uh, comes from chest x-ray to learning all kinds of endoscopies, motility studies, uh, respiratory function testing, uh, uh, in endoscopies for the larynx, pharynx, and so on. So do we need to do all these things for all the patients? We need to have an algorithm, and I think we need to come up at the end of the this meeting with what we as uh, Egyptians in the Egyptian market should do um, in our area because what applies in the States or in England is definitely different than what should be applied in Egypt. But and on, on, on a consensus, and you have a patient who is non-smoker, who is, uh, doesn't have ACE inhibitors and normal chest x-ray, so this is the basic standard you should do. You do a basic uh, normal chest x-ray, so you think about one of those five things. Either desert discharge, reflux, pertussis, eosinophilic bronchitis, uh, reactive airway disease, and upper airway cough syndrome, which we're going to um, uh, speak a little bit more about it. Uh, in the, uh, if you have symptoms of nasal symptoms, it's, it's uh, very clear. So there could be a relation, and then you refer the patient to the ENT doctor, and then we do our uh, examination and investigations, including maybe the CT scan to, uh, to, uh, to confirm or exclude the sinusitis. When it comes to the, the GERD, the reflux, so the numbers are convincing. Up to 30% uh, uh, having, uh, of causes of chronic cough having reflux. Um, but, but not necessarily to be standard symptoms like heartburn or regurgitation. Some, some patients, up to 70% of patients of reflux who are having extra superficial symptoms may not have the heartburn. So you actually don't need an acid to cause the, the, the cough. But the physiology, it could be minor aspirations. It could be irritation of the quote unquote the cough receptors. Diagnosis may depend on the pH monitoring. And uh, what I do, I usually give them a trial therapy of the um, uh, of the anti-reflux measurements. And then really, to be, uh, to be honest with you, I'm sometimes very confused when a, a colleague from the chest department send me a patient already given all these steroids and the cough river, the antiflux and these things and sending him back to me, I find it difficult to treat those patients. But there is a good relation that the, the, the reflux by itself, increasing the intra-abdominal pressure, increasing the, um, the uh, lower, uh, lower sphincter uh, uh, patency, this may add more to the, the cough as well, so uh, sort of relation. <clears throat> the non-asthmatic isonophilic bronchitis is very strange because it's isonophilic airway inflammation. When you do the testing, spirometry, and those things, usually they are normal, and uh, they depend on the isonophilia and the blood or in the sputum. And, uh, of course, one thing also, again, trial of uh, steroid treatment, and some of them improve. Now, pertussis, uh, is it really coming back? <clears throat> uh, the thing is, when you uh, vaccine the patients, it takes like uh, um, from 10 to 10, from 5 to 10 years, and no longer the vaccine is effective. And what happens when you are in, when you're getting a pertussis in the an older age group? They don't have the whoops, so they're only coughing. So we are not sure are this is a pertussis or not. Uh, you need to think about it because the diagnosis is very difficult. And there is a saying it's called uh, the hundred day cough. Uh, they link this to pertussis. And when you think about it, you if you, you can give the uh, treatment for that, it causes disruption of the uh, respiratory epithelium, leading to secretions and plugs and so on in the respiratory tract. Then comes a very uh, perplexing uh, item, which is reactive airway disease. It's very well understood. When you have irritations, uh, any kind of irritation, you cough. Um, it could be a silent asthma. It could be uh, post-viral. Uh, uh, uh. So 
in, in the cough variant asthma, it's a, it's a salt symptom. Spirometry again is normal. Uh, they're saying it's up to 20%, 25% of the asthmatics. Uh, you may actually, as chest physicians, may add more on this. But again, patient respond to steroids. This is really important. Patient having upper respiratory tract infection, they start to cough and then continue to cough, and then we say this is post-viral. The only uh, positive thing that you have a history of upper respiratory tract infection. This is what I'm talking about. The Lancet in 2006 published this presentation, uh, actually in 2013, published this, which is the chronic cough as a neuropathic disorder. And then it gives um, me some detail here that you have any ir irritant uh, irritating the um, cough receptors, which are uh, the TRPV1, TRPA1. Uh, uh, these things are new to me. I'm the first time to read them, but it leads to the cough somehow, these receptors. And these receptors are present everywhere. These are present in the sinuses, in the pharynx, in the larynx, in the trachea in the external auditory meatus, in the esophagus, the stomach, diaphragm, pericardium, these receptors in the domain distribution of the fifth nerve, eleventh <coughs> nerve, and tenth nerve. So anything in those areas irritating these nerves may lead to cough, and then we need to be aware. <clears throat> and then because it's not something not very solid, then start to give it different names. The airway sensory hyperactivity syndrome, the cough hypersensitivity syndrome, the chronic cough hypersensitivity syndrome, the cough hypersensitivity syndrome. So all of them are agreeing that we didn't really know what is going on, but there is some irritation and they're triggered by different things, mechanical, chemical, thermal, leading to the cough. So actually, in my in my thinking, it's a waste basket of symptom complex. There are symptom complex, we are not sure what is the cause of it. So American invention saying upper airway cough syndrome. And uh, the history, the patient, uh, uh, these are typical patients of what we see, coughing, dinner drip, tickle in the throat, nasal congestion, some change of voice, some mucoid, mucoid discharge, you may see it or not, couple stone appearance in the, in, the, in the pharynx, but we need to exclude definitely other causes, which is the long list as we already described. When it comes to treatment, Voltaire said a very impressive statement. The art of medicine is, I'm using the patient until nature cures the disease. But you have to be patient with those patients. So, when it comes to the post-nasal drip, a long list of medicines, antihistamines, steroids, nasal steroids, antibiotics if there is infection. Then when it comes to the, the reflux, you need to have change of life. You give the H2 blockers, the, the allignates, uh, PPI. It's a long list, you may end up having surgery. Uh, when it comes to pertussis, the macrolides is the clarisomycin is important, and also the anti-inflammatory drugs as well. The uh, asthma and is um, uniphilic bronchitis. You're going with the internet, the steroids. And then, of course, I'm not going to talk about the treatment of asthma in front of pulmonologists because you know better, of course, than I do. But it comes to me the uh, non-specific, the idiopathic, the syndrome. Name it whatever you like to name it. Actually, here we as ENT and especially our uh, one of our areas, which is the speech pathologist, they are our colleagues of Esmat Tahatub. They can help with this the speech pathology management. So they decrease the cough sensitivity, they, learn, they teach the patient how to increase the voluntary volitional control on the cough, they decrease laryngeal irritation, decrease laryngeal muscle contraction, which helps. Then comes another important thing, which is the gabapentin. It's a, uh, uh, it suppresses the ectopic discharge uh, from injured nerves. It's, uh, actually, that I said, Dr. Magdi Hamid taught me that to give them tegretol. Now they're giving them the gabapentin. They're giving them the amitriptines. Uh, you can depend on the cough suppressants. And of course, the experimenter now, they're talking about uh, an anti-receptor. We, we, we express the, the, the TRPV1 and TRPA1. Now they are trying to manufacture drugs to act against the, these receptors, and um, this is the effect of the gabapentines on the improvement of the symptoms when you give the gabapentines for the treatment. And this is a very impressive study in 2014, actually, published again in P2X3 receptor antagonist. It's a phase two study. They're calling it AF219, maybe in the market after a few years. We're going to see this medicine, which is acting anti the receptors. So the, and by and last, there are some tips that we really need to practice. Failure to recognize silent sinusitis. Failure to recognize non-acidic reflux. Failure to recognize esophageal dysmotility. At least when you fail to do that, you're gonna have chronic cough, more chronic cough. Uh, remember, inhaled medications may exacerbate cough. Be patient with treatment, depend on Voltaire's advice. Give the patient some time until nature takes its effect. Two, three months. 
failure to treat coexisting causes like obesity, uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, congestive heart failure. Of course, we now we have to be very strict with patients, avoiding tobacco, uh, irritant, toxins, and so on. And then comes the volitional and the visual therapy. Although it might, may sound very funny, but it's really important because uh, they educate them to avoid triggers, they educate them to clean the larynx, to cough control, and then again counseling more and more. And this is a study showing that the chest video therapy had a good effect on the improvement of the symptoms of the chronic cough, uh, decreasing or improving the quality of life scores. Uh, don't remember at the end that there are some home remedies. We use them: the hassel, the lemon, the herbal tea, the hydrotherapy, the nana, the arsous, the zaatar, and something else. Marmaria, the magouda in the sham, the ginger. These things, when you use it, sometimes it improves cough. But again, there is no evidence-based medicine for these things. To wrap up. Chronic cough is common, frequently unexplained. High physical and mental health morbidity and quality of life issues. Common things are still common. Many patients have more than one cause in a healthy non-smoker with normal chest X-ray and no ECI inhibitor. Then think about postnatal drip, reflux, reactive airway disease, pertussis. Uh, how are we going to work with the other patients? We need to come up with some consensus or some, I wouldn't say, guideline in the Egyptian market. How we do to do with those patients? Are we going to do all the investigations that I mentioned, or we're going to select some investigations for some patients? Um, uh, most patients respond to state treatment. For unexplained cough, few drug treatment options are available, but the integrated physical and mental health approach is really needed. And uh, at the end, I need to thank you very much for that. Uh, but I need to add, um, uh, invite you to the Pan-African Congress, which is going to be in March in Luxor. Uh, we need to cooperate more and more between the pulmonology and the ENT. And also I invite you to publish in our journal, which is the Egyptian Journal of in Eno Throat and the Allied Sciences. It is um, uh, uh, acknowledged and recognized on the internet in the uh, Scopus and the and the Elsevier uh, websites. Uh, we're trying hard to go into the PubMed with your help, inshallah, and help of the other specialties related to the ENT. More publishing, we may go to the PubMed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Osama, for your elegant presentation. واكشولي احنا بنسيب النيتشر اللي بيتعالج في الاخر يعني احنا بنشكر طبعا الاستاذ الدكتور طارق صفوان الاستاذ الدكتور عادل الخطاب الاستاذ الدكتور ياسر والاستاذ الدكتور عماد والاستاذ الدكتور اشرف على تعويتي ودلوقتي انا بندعو الاستاذ الدكتور نيفين عبد الفتاح هتتكلم على الكف فروم ذا بالمونري بيرسبكتيف Uh, Mr. Chairman, dear professors and colleagues, I would like first to thank Professor Tarek Safwat for his kind invitation. And, and uh, I'm, I'll be brief, and uh, I think um, you might get a little bit bored because Professor Osema already covered every aspect in the presentation. <laughs> uh, to start with, uh, uh, I'll be talking about cough from the pulmonary perspective. <laughs> Cough displays uh, a wide spectrum and uh, uh, vast um, implication for both the patient and the physician. Uh, it is not necessarily a clinical symptoms uh, uh, of clinical significance, an abnormal symptoms of clinical significance, and actually it is a symptoms of many faci facets. It is um, uh, it uh, it is a mechanism to protect the lung, as well as it is uh, a warning sign of a disease, and it. Uh, as well, when the system, uh, the symptom is persistent, it uh, it might prove uh, to be a, a dangerous uh, sign. Uh, so, what is cough? Cough, in general, is an uh, expulsive uh, motor act that comprises three st stages: inspiratory, compressive, and expulsive phase. At first, um, oh, this is an, this is a wrong movie anyway, but it's inspiration of um, the inspiration of uh, two to three liters of air is inhaled and then the glottis and the vocal cords are uh, shut uh, followed by contraction of the intercostal muscles and the obliques and then the sudden opening of the vocal cord and the expulsion of the air the air the the large differential pressure the air is expelled at very high speed so um, uh, velocities of the air re uh, ranges from 80 to 100 miles per hour, which is sometimes uh, faster than 
the, the tennis ball or even a baseball speed. Anyways, the video is not working, so I apologize for that. Um, cough could be initiated either voluntarily or uh, reflexively, and uh, the cough reflex arc display here will help us uh, a little bit to understand uh, uh, why is it so hard to tell where is cough coming from? Because of the vast distributions of, re of the receptors, as Dr. Osama previously mentioned, it is uh, present along many sensory nerves, the trigeminal, the superior laryngeal, the recurrent, uh, the vagus nerve, and the glossopharyngeal nerve. And cough reflex is one of the most complex reflexes in our body. It starts with irritation of the receptors, uh, uh, which are present in, in this is as well, she was supposed to be a video, but it's not working. So it was, it should start with irritation of the receptors present in sometimes in expected places like the trachea, the large bronchi or bronchiole. Then uh, sometimes it is present in unexpected, as we said, in the ear canal, in the eardrums, in the esophagus, or in the pericardium or the diaphragm. And then uh, these impulses travels along the afferent nerves to the cuff center in the medulla which then initiate and organize the uh, contraction of the expiratory muscles through the afferent nerves. Because cough is of clinical importance to clinicians in general, the American College of Chest Physicians uh, uh, published its first evidence-based consensus uh, in 1998, and then this consensus was updated in 2006 and this year in 2014. And I would like to mention that the recommendation and the diagnostic scheme that I will follow in this presentation, this will be mainly the reference. So what is the starting point if I need to approach cough? Uh, I think the first starting point is the medical uh, history. We have to ask the patient about the duration of cough because this will uh, immediately differentiate cough into with other acute, which uh, where the cough lasts only for three weeks, or subacute if it lasts only from three to eight weeks, or chronic cough if it lasts for more than three weeks. If the patient presented with acute cough, using the history, as I said, and examination, and uh, mainly chest X-ray, it will give us an implication whether the disease is a serious illness like pneumonia or pulmonary embolism, or it is usually the common causes, which is not life-threatening, like infectious, mainly upper respiratory tract infection, common cold, or an exacerbation of an already present disease, such as chronic bronchitis, or is it because of due to environmental and occupational uh, irritation. Uh, differentiation between pneumonia and serious uh, uh, life-threatening disease is simple and um, uh, we will rely on the radiological physical findings as I said but to highlight the recommendation uh, in the ACCP as I said before there are some points in patient presenting with common cold we should start immediately uh, for uh, trial therapy or empiric therapy using first generation antihistamines and decongestant whether or not we apply antibiotics it is always debatable in common cold in patient with acute bronchitis the recommendation was not to send sputum analysis routinely or serological or viral culture and also we need to start empirically uh, straight ahead with bronchodilators mucolytic with or without antibiotic. In case the cough persists and it has a the characteristic whooping sound and we uh, suspect uh, pertussis, um, the only confirmatory test here is to send or to uh, isolate the organism, which is the Bordetella pertussis. And here we need to send for nasopharyngeal aspirate or swab for culture. PCR is available, but it's not routinely recommended. Also, the fourfold rides of the IgE or IgG in serum is consistent with the infection. And once infection is confirmed and the diagnosis is confirmed, a macrolide antibiotic should be prescribed and vaccination plans should be implemented according to the CDC guideline. In subacute cough, uh, we need to differentiate whether it's post-infectious or non-infectious, and it's almost more or less the same as an acute cough for, for the reasons and causes, and the management of non-post-infectious cough, it should be managed as chronic cough. The chronic cough, actually, this is a more complex problem because the differential diagnosis is broader and because more, uh, there more, or more than one condition can be present simultaneously. Um, and here, uh, the starting point for uh, uh, the, to reach a proper schematic and uh, systematic uh, approach for the diagnosis is to start with the medical history because the medical history can differentiate many conditions 
as Dr. Osama said also as well before, it, uh, smoking history is important and smokers should be counseled and to stop smoking. Patients who are using angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors should switch to another class of antihypertensive. If there is history of TB or contact with TB, this will eliminate cough due to tuberculosis or infectious disease. Uh, and etc. But then we should focus on the common causes, which are the four common conditions for chronic cough. The upper airway cough syndrome, the GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease, bronchial asthma, and non-asthmatic uh, uh, eosinophilic bronchitis. And these are uh, many studies published to um, highlight that these are the most common uh, causes of cough recently uh, in the literature. So when to consider upper airway cough syndrome, uh, we should consider it based on three criteria, the presence of physical uh, and symptomatology. First, if the patient is coming and complaining of uh, frequent headaches, uh, sinusitis, post-nasal drip, uh, 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 frequent sore throats, and actually it shouldn't be really thoroughly investigated. We should start also uh, with the therapy, uh, antihistaminics decongested with or without uh, antibiotics and then if the symptoms persistent uh, and there is suspicious of sinusitis maybe then we should investigate like imaging for uh, imaging uh, like CT sinuses or upper laryngoscope and this was covered by Professor Osama so I'm not going to dwell on it. As regard the GERD, uh, patients are presenting usually with, uh, with GIT symptoms. They present with heartburn, reflux, regurgitations, and um, uh, also in the recommendations of the SCCP here is to not exhaust any investigation and to start with anti-reflux therapy, first by educating the patient to modify his diet habits. Then we need to prescribe proton pump inhibitors and prokinetics, and the physician should mitigate the presence, whether there is presence or not, of comorbid disease that might be increasing the reflux. If it is um, a, a mandatory to investigation, if the cough persists, we can perform 24-hour esophageal pH monitoring. And this can be performed before or after therapy. Before, um, before therapy to diagnose, but even if the amount of all the, the attacks of cough related to the reflux is not frequent, it does not exclude the, the, the chronic cough due to GERD. After therapy, to modify the dose or maybe to intensify the treatment. In non-acidic GERD, objective studies may be asked for, which are the barium esophagography and uh, the uh, upper endoscope and gastric emptying. Some investigations should not be routinely recommended, like assessing for lipid-laden macrophages in bowel fluid and the exhaled nitric oxide measurements and the Bernstein test and the inhaled tussigenic challenges with capskin, which is like a um, um, uh, actually. Uh, if the patient persists with normal chest X-ray, normal spirometry, and no evidence of variable airflow obstruction or bronchial hyperresponsiveness, then the non-asthmatic uh, non eosinophilic bronchitis should be considered. And here, sputum induction and bronchial wash using bronchoscopy should be investigated for the presence of eosinophilia, which is the only confirmatory test. And uh, inhaled corticosteroid therapy. Uh, should be administered to the patient, um, and if the cough persistent, we should switch to systemic uh, corticosteroids. It is still we still need to recognize that there are other uh, conditions that accounts for cough, even if it is less common. We have definitely the chronic bronchitis, the interstitial lung disease, lung tumors, tuberculosis, and post-infectious cough in immune compromised host cough due to environmental and occupational exposure, cough with the peritoneal dialysis, psychogenic cough, oropharyngeal dysphagia, cough due to cardiac disease. And uh, in, in these several conditions, we need to exhaust every tools and investigation we have. Sometimes it's invasive to reach the proper diagnosis. If at any point we did not reach after exhaustion all of the uh, diagnostic tools and after following re religiously the guidelines, then, by exclusion, this is called an unexplained cough. The impact, in conclusion, the impact of cough on health is substantial. It is the most common complaint leading patients to consult with primary care physician. It has a significant impact on the physical, psychological, and social health uh, and um, impaired quality of life in patients. The annual aggregate cost of treating cough on a global base is estimated to exceed billions of dollars, and therefore, 
we shouldn't really give up easily until we reach a proper diagnosis. Thank you. And I'm sorry because the videos did not work. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Nivin. And now uh, we invite uh, Professor uh, Malak to talk about the uh, pediatric perspective of course. At first, I want uh, to thank uh, my professors uh, who invited me to be here today, Dr. Tore, Dr. Aydel, the whole committee. Actually, once I come here, I feel that I am within my family, and I feel it's a heartly invitation. So I'm very happy, and I'm sincerely appreciating. So the start is always to say salamu alaikum and to introduce myself. And my name is Malak Shaheen, and I'm a professor of pediatric medicine, pediatric respiratory medicine at Ain Shams University. And I must tell you a secret. I am a fascinated person about quality. I've studied quality, and I'm teaching quality in my university. We have a diploma about quality. And so I want to transfer two items about quality as a start. First, who are we? We are the place we are working in. If you ask anybody in Japan, who are you? He's going to tell you, I am Toyota, I am Samsung, and he will never tell you his name. So I am Ain Shams. This is me, <laughs> at first. And second, we must tell why we are here today. We must know our target. Everything we do in life, we must see what's the end. As Stephen Covey say, look to the end by. We are here to enjoy. Start to enjoy, learn, and know something new. I hope I can eat something. I'm within my professors, great professors. So I hope first to enjoy, and then maybe you can hear something interesting. So we are pediatrician. We are fond of stories like our clients. So I must tell you a story, the flashback story, the early, early beginning. When the baby starts his life, he starts by cough of life. And I must tell you, as pediatrician, we are fond of listening to these cough. We feel that we have made our job. So we are not sadistic person, but we want to listen to this cough. This means our child started his life. And cough is a normal reflex. It happens even inside in utero life. And sometimes people who are watching the intrauterine ultrasound, they're watching the, the baby doing a cough reflex. However, it's a reflex. It's a normal protective reflex. It has receptors, as you notice, and the most potent receptors are found in the upper respiratory tract. And that's why we can imagine that the most important stimulus for cough is going to be in the upper airway. This is very important to, under, to understand how this reflex really works. And then, the three stages, very famous. All of us have studied physiology in eternal, long life before, but they are uh, three stages. First, starting by the vocal cords start to be widely opened and deep inspiration happens and then it's closing and a lot intense contraction of the muscles of the chest and abdomen occurs to make a very severe pressure and then the vocal cords open with severe impulsion of air with great speed. As my colleague Dr. Levine started wanted to show you this very fascinating movie. It's very nice that show that the speed of air of cough is much, much more than throwing a, a ball with very strong force. So it's a rail force. It pushes whatever is harmful to the body. It's protection from God. So the, the real question here, is cough a bad thing? Is a friend or a fool an enemy? This is something we must understand and think about it especially in children, because if you want to define what's real normal cough, we can know the limit of abnormal cough. And there was a very interesting study, was done by a great professors um, in UK about how to measure the limit of cough in normal children. And they have also measured that in adults. And of course, it was as predicted to find it more and more in children than in adults and more in younger children, and as long as they are growing up, the intensity of normal cough is getting less and less. But this was the average in the study done by Dr. Bush in uh, Imperial College of London. 
that the, the average or the mean for the normal child to have about 11 cuffs per 24 hours, but it could be normal up to 34 times of cuff. How did they measure that? This is very interesting. They have used a very nice multi-parametric recording device, and they have recorded that and published that in archives of children, the, the, the journal of Royal College. So what's different? We are speaking about children. So the normal cough in children is much more than adults. This is first. And second, there are specific, um, you, we can say, conditions or obligations related to children. Of course, their immunity is not like adults, and that's why they are liable for much more viral infections than, than others. And that's why, as considering viruses, the most important cause of upper respiratory tract infections and the, per, the permanently evident cause for inducing cough, so they are much more liable. The second is maturational differences. Of course, their body, their systems, their functions are different, and maturation of systems is different. And thirdly, their response to medicine, which is actually permissible to be given to children, is also different. And medical history, they cannot tell the history. They cannot tell what they are suffering from. And we only depend upon what's said by parents. And sometimes it's vague, and sometimes it's incomplete. And finally, which is the most critical condition that I have realized that we have very, very few randomized controlled trials in children. And I have searched a lot about the latest guidelines for children. And unfortunately, I didn't find, except uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Naveen said, about the American Academy of Just Physicians. And actually, it was only expert opinion. That's they have guiding us to cough management. Only expert opinion, which is evidence-based language, it's D level. So, we are trying to tell the story. We are trying to point what's available. And let's say, what's the problem about cough as a syndrome? Is it a, z a disease once it's exceeding the normal level? Actually, cough is a symptom. It's not a disease. It's part of other disease. And what is more important, that it is one of the top five uh, number of doctor's visits are related to cough. And it's accounting to 30% of all consultations in children less than 11 years. I can tell you the story of yesterday. Yesterday was a famous day of cough. I have been visited by multiple families. All of them are coughing. All of them are suffering from cold. There's a strange ha thing happening in our country this week. I don't know what's happening. All the families are coughing. All the family families are ill. And so some of them coming to us and some using medication, they have tried to, to give remedy to themselves and to their children. It's called over-counter drugs or therapy. And most of them is without evidence. And it's, they are very costly, as Dr. Osama said. This is according to the literature of American uh, literature. They cost about 40 billion per year about over-the-counter drugs for cough. This is very serious in terms of quality as well. This is a lot of waste. Lost of time from work and school. Not only because the children are ill, but because everybody is annoyed by a coughing person sitting among them. And so the teacher asks the mother, please keep him at home till he is cured. I can't guarantee that other families could complain because he could be infectious. And that's why we are messing a lot. Everybody coughing a lot, he's going to stay at home not only because he is ill, but the community is not accepting to share him that. And sleep disturbances, and of course, this leads to a lot of troubles. As a pediatrician, I used to hear a lot the complaint of cough. But I have, in my mind, a lot of red flags. When I'm going to be aroused to listen carefully about the symptom, when I'm going to concentrate and consider this as an under, not an ordinary complaint. Let's share the journey of the red flags for a pediatrician. First, if the neonatal onset of cough occurs in the first month of life, if the child is coughing during feeding, if there is a sudden onset of cough or a history of choking, which may turn me to the diagnosis of a foreign body inhalation, when there is a chronic cough, and as mentioned by my professors and my colleagues, if it is exceeding from three to eight weeks, I'm listening very carefully what's happening, subacute and chronic. If it is continuous, 
If it is unremitting, I give medication and he is not responsive. If it is getting worse, and if there are associated critical symptoms and signs, for example, shortness of breathing, dyspnea, hypoxia, cyanosis, rapid breathing, strider, night sweats, weight loss, and hemoptysis, and of course, every other symptoms plus cough, it's to myself and to my colleagues a lot of meaning. So, also signs of chronic lung disease. Cough, once it's related to other symptoms of chest wall deformity, digit, um, uh, club, clubbing of the fingers and poor growth. If there are parental concern about persistence of cough despite reassurance, I could be as a physician considering what's happening to the boy or the girl is normal. But if the parents are over-concerned about that, I must take care about, care about this. The quality of life of the child and his family is a big concern. It's not only we treat the child, we must ensure that they are reassured enough and to take what they are complaining seriously. And also the clinician instinct. Sometimes I face an acute attack of cough and from the first minute I feel this is not an ordinary complain and this is a serious disease. For example, if I suspect a whooping cough. Although in the majority of children, they, are, they don't come with a typical whoop. So, cough is a symptom of a disease. It's not a disease. It could be a symptom of a syndrome, could be of any other cause. And knowing the cause, um, unfortunately, most of the times is dependent upon history and examination solely. So, we categorize cough, as it's mentioned, uh, two to three weeks. Let, the, let, let us have the cut off value of three weeks, less than three weeks, and then from three to <coughs> six weeks, and then more than four to six weeks, is, this is considered cough in most of the literature. Unfortunately, there is no single cut off value. In different literature, you are going to find different cut off values. However, the natural history of cough in children could reach up to three weeks. So any cough persistent after three weeks must take my attention. These are one of the surveys done for children. And excuse me, I'm coughing as well. <coughs> I'm asthmatic as well. <laughs> no problem. So this is one of the surveys happened to, to, to be performed to children, and it announced the most common causes, and it was arranged according to the frequency in this study. However, this frequency could be different from one study to, uh, to the other, considering the duration of pediatric age. For example, if we do this survey for infants, it could be different in listing and in ascending uh, manner, different than school-aged children. <coughs> As you notice, no. I'm sorry. As Hadrat Kumsi, common cold or viral infections constitute the majority of causes. And then we, <coughs> we can find bronchitis, we can find asthma, whooping cough, crop, influenza, pneumonia, foreign body. <laughs> it's not a very <laughs> familiar voice, but I'm so sorry. And here in the study, they have mentioned reflux as the last one. Actually, actually, I disagree with this. Reflux is a common comorbidity in children. <coughs> and could be the sole cause, especially in infants and in young infants. I can tell Hadaratkum a story. I have a lot of children coming to me at the age below six months, and all of them are suffering from cough. And the mother tell me the complaints and I give her my advices, and then she get the prescription and asked me, what you have written for me? And she discovered that all the treatment I wrote in the prescription is related to the stomach. Is anti-emetic. Sometimes I give also proton bomb inhibitors. 
And she asked me, where are the cough medicines? I came to you with cough. You didn't give me any cough medicines. And I tell her, this is your medication. Your child is suffering from reflux because you have a poor feeding technique to him and that's why he is suffering. Please follow my advice. As I say, from, 100, from zero to 100, don't disturb anything during his feeding. Don't allow reflux to happen. Follow my advice and meet me after one week and we can see the result. So, reflux is a very common inhibitant in children. This is a very common classification for cough in literature for children, normal or expected cough. Sometimes cough is expected once they smell irritant gases. Anything that irritate the receptors of cough will lead them to cough. This is expected. And not a specific cough which is related to the viral infection. If you leave him alone, he is going to cure without any interruption. But what is more important, the small proportion of specific causes. Those children need to be backed up. Those children who have the red flags, who need our attention to treat them carefully. So let's start non-specific. It's also all the viral causes. It could be habit, as a tick. It could be psychological. I don't agree that gastroesophageal reflux is a common cause. It's a specific cause. <coughs> so. These are one of the common causes of specific cough, cystic fibrosis, immune deficiency, primary ciliary dyskinesia, recurrent pulmonary aspirations, retained inhaled foreign body, chronic bronchitis, bronchi bronchial tuberculosis, and congenital malformation, which, which could happen. We could have structural problem that lead the child to cough all through. For example, as tracheoesophageal fistula, or what's very famous in our childhood uh, period, which is uh, tracheolaryngeal bronchomalacia. The etiology, of course, of asthma is on the top of the list. We have also three big major diagnoses in children. We can remember them. Number one, infection. Viral number one, or it could be bacterial, if it's going to lead to what's called persistent bacterial bronchitis. Second, to be asthma. Third, to be reflux. And sometimes there's comorbidity. And sometimes reflux is aiding to everything, according to age, according to our instinct and suspicion. Also. Upper airway disorders, and as I told uh, in the reflex, receptors in the upper airway are more much sensitive than the lower airway, and that's why we predict cough to be more intense in children suffering from upper airway problems. Gourd and cough, this is an eternal cause. Airway lesions and cough. Environmental tobacco smoke and irritants, this is very common. Chronic nocturnal cough is not only asthma, however, it's one of the hallmarks of asthma, but reflux also could be manifested early by night cough. Once the child eat his supper and go to bed, less than two hours, he started to have shocking attacks and cough at night. Post-infectious cough, is, this is very important. But what leading to our attention in this as pediatric pulmonologists that we are caring much about pertussis. Nobody is immune. And whatever we give the vaccinations, they never give immunity. And it's written and documented that validity of the vaccine is from zero to 80%. And even resistance started to appear. It happens. The mother could be infected and the child as well. And that's why I must give macrolide. I must consider, consider that if I suspect that. Mycoplasma could be treated by amoxicillin. And if it is going to be what's called persistent bacterial bronchitis, the literature says that I must give treatment from two to three weeks persistently. What about steroids? Do we give them steroids? If they are asthmatic, it's solvent. But sometimes, if it is viral infection, actually we give inhaled steroids and we give also short courses of systemic steroids. However, unfortunately, no evidence for that. And especially we give dexamethasone. Why? Because if the larynx is irritated, this is the most potent as anti-inflammatory and also in relation to the laryngeal element. Parental expectation, this is very serious. We must assure our parents and discuss with them what really bothers them. History taking and examination are the main tool for diagnosis. All the questions could be answered to guide us. Especially in investigation, we could do the CD or sinus CT, flexible bronchoscopy, and also aspiration techniques for assessment of gourd. Treatment of cough in children. This is the start. As I told you, I like stories. This is Alice in Wonderland. And the rabbit is running and said, 
Don't just do something, stand there. If we leave, the cough is going to be cured, especially if it is acute, non-specific. But we cannot tell that to the mother. We must help her. Do I give this over-the-counter treatment? Yes, I do. And also others, like what's found, عسل, حبة البركة, اللبان اللي هو عند العطار البلدي, كل الحاجات دي, they are very nice. But also, treatment, treatment of the causes specifically is the cornerstone if we are suffering from a specific cough. For example, treatment of asthma, giving antimicrobials correct when antihistamine is questionable. How long cough will persist? Cough will persist at least two to three weeks. This is an evidence must be told to the parents. And if they are not understanding this, this is going to be a problem. No, the problem is the cough to persist as it is, no improvement, and if it is increasing. How to prevent? Vaccination is very important. All the vaccines of the children, obligatory and non-obligatory, must be given in time. Suspicious children with wet chest, as I, as I like to call it, I tell the mother, your child has a wet chest. If he is suffering from liability for infection or asthma, I must give him the flu, the influenza vaccines, I give them the pneumococcal vaccines, or other related suitable vaccines for him. And finally, I want to th say a very big thank you. Actually, I have learned a lot today and enjoy to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Malak, for your elegant talk. And also, thank you very much for your coffee. I'm going to be here. 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 I'm going to be here.